Jetzt gehen wir gleich mit, mit dem vierten Stadtgespräch. Und diesmal geht es um Beijing. Und ich freue mich sehr, dass Shalu, äh, Shalu Go, Shalu Go bei uns ist und ähm, einiges über Peking aktuelle Situation auch die zukünftige Situation erzählen wird. I'm not very old, I'm only 40, but my, I, my, my, no, but the, the, my architectural taste is abs absolutely traditional because I hate Beijing modern Bauhaus. I hate the modern Beijing design so badly. The reason I say I'm not that old, but I experienced the three China, you know, in the last 40 years, because for me, China is imperial China until 30 years ago. Then Soviet China, which is the last 20, 25 years ago. And then the commercial modern China, which is happening now. And in my last 40 years, I, I experienced that history. Hat das Ganze, was, was, was jetzt auch aktuell darüber gesch äh, geschrieben wird, äh, auch mit einer noch nicht endete Form der Urbanisierung in China was zu tun, dass immer mehr Menschen dann nach Beijing kommen? Urbanisierung in China ist nicht unik, aber die most extreme in der ganzen Welt. Weil China's population, 1.3 billion, official number, so what is non-official number, And the size of China is the size of Europe. So the, the phenomenon going on in a little European country would be 10 times bigger and more chaotic, more tragic in China. Now, 20 years ago in China, we have a 1 billion peasants because China is agricultural society, a very traditional, traditional society based on the massive farming land. So, 80% of the population, which means a billion people are peasant, they never lived in the city. They don't understand the red light or green light. When they cross the street, they will bring their buffaloes or cows. Now, in the last 20 years, about half a billion of the peasants been pushed into the urbanization. In the next 20 years time, which is 2030, Now, will be one billion citizens living in China. So that's like, you know, 20 years ago, it's one billion peasants living in China. And that would be a crazy phenomenon how people suddenly change their identity card from peasant to citizen, which I had. I changed my ID card when I was 20 years old from Nongmin, which is peasant ID card, to citizen ID card. And eventually, you know, I could live in the city and work in the city. But I was one of the very few cases. I was modernized successfully. And most people, I don't know. Vielleicht sagen Sie noch ein paar Worte zu, zu der ähm, sogenannten ikonischen Architektur, wie es manche jetzt, äh, auch bezeichnen, zum Beispiel äh, Stadion und äh, Fernsehturm, nenne ich das mal, und andere Bauten. Ich habe erfahren, dass doch von einigen Architekten, aber auch intellektuell in Beijing und in China, äh, auch in anderen Städten, genau diese Architektur, diese Entwicklung sehr kritisiert wird. Falls es kritisiert wird, wie äußert sich das? Wo äußert sich das? Können Sie das vielleicht kurz beschreiben? The modern architect, the star architect, is someone like Ram Kuhas. I can say, well, I'm looking at the camera, I can say um, with his some amazing designs in the Western society, especially in the small, small urban space, his stuff perhaps has great meaning, a great aesthetic uh, reference. But when he designed the, the big Chinese stuff, for example, the, the, the China CCTV tower, the central station, Tower in Beijing, the massive, massive buildings tower to put the Chinese central television, the whole scale, you know, 10 times bigger than BBC tower. Um, the, the power, the money he used, but it's so alienating the real people from that space. No one can enter. And also the disaster later on it caused because they had a disaster fire. And after the fire, the, the, the place was being stopped using for years. 
and then they have to rebuild again. Okay, it's such a cold, inhuman architect designed by the Western architect has a great ambition. In the barbarian country, has no idea yet what the postmodern mean, but why we need that? Why we need that? Because the country is so innocent to accept the Western modern design. And another, another case, sorry, the Beijing Opera House which we call the Beijing Great Hall Performing House, which is designed by a French architect, Paul Andrew. I like, I like his work. Now, this French architect work, this massive, we call the giant egg, which is on Tiananmen Square, right next to the People's Congress Hall and the Forbidden City, in such a historical place. But this place is a forbidden land for Chinese to enter because Tiananmen Square is a place for political protest. So the police occupy the area, no one can enter. And that area is every year people, people's congress going on for the government. And then next to it is Fibonacci City. You can't just enter, it's, 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 it's a saint place. So such a huge opera house in this dead zone, no people can enter. And also he created, this French, amazing French architect, created the artificial lake around this giant opera house. And for me, I think it's basically this huge money and a huge ambition killed the space. No one can enter, no one can use it, and it's empty. I think as an individual, I like chaotic cities, you know, very messy, chaotic city, like a Mexico city. It's not designed by the state. As an individual, I hate, hate state-designed city. And Beijing is a state-designed city. If you go to Hong Kong, of course, everyone lives on the sky lift. You know, it goes up, you know, shopping mall up, you're going down, that's your house. There's a park upstairs with water somewhere. Because it's a very special, unique, tiny little city uh, geography, but with, with this vertical dimension. But Beijing is horizontal dim dimension. But the, the, the designing is in a vertical way, which is very strange. So it made the life very, very complicated just to buy a little ice cream. Now, <laughs> now, with that, so I've been living 10 years for 11 years. And in Beijing, you know, I transformed myself from a little peasant to a so-called intellectual. It's a, such a demanding city for you to understand how a country try to transfer from very backward imperial feudal system to very efficient, extremely fast, extremely practical socialist state. And also it's a city forced you to understand, to abandon some socialist or communist value just to get capitalistic characters to use it so you can get life much quicker and more practical. Now, okay, this extremeness, only Chinese can cope, I think, because we, we followed, or we always followed the state policy to change our lifestyle. And of course, for Westerners, it's very difficult to cope. The popular Bauhaus concept in Europe, I never, I, I was and I am never a fan of Bauhaus, yeah. I understand the, the success of Bauhaus in the 1930s, 1930s, 1940s is revolutionary, especially in Europe, because the size of Europe in each urban space is very small. And the Bauhaus at that time, especially say 1930s, allow normal people to have its own space and doesn't have to become a house owner. Everyone share. So the idea of Bauhaus in the 1930s is absolutely socialistic, solidarity, you know, all the good things. But for a country like China, one country has the size of Europe, it has massive land, massive land. Now, to save the space is not the first consideration at all for a place like China or USA or Russia. So the the price we paid to, to buy the idea of Bauhaus in China is too profound because to build those architect style, we have to destroy the whole imperial style, the gate, you know, the, the, gate the city wall, the, the imperial style, to destroy the whole thousands of years of lifestyle, to build those very simple, bland looking Bauhaus. You know, so when I talk about the identity change, it's very, uh, physical and practical. 
uh, because the government designed a new city, brand new city, brand new town will host three million or eight million people somewhere far away. It's, a, it's called a relocation, yeah, Zhuan Yi, relocation. So your grandma, your grand grandpa, your great uncle, your, your whatever, your great 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 boy, all the identity you build in this town forever lost. The la for Chinese, because we don't have road culture like American B generation, you drive on the car, you go to San Francisco and you come back. It's never our Chinese culture. Chinese people doesn't go on the road unless you don't have money, you go on the road to make some money, economic change. So we are the culture which rooted, rooted, rooted people with rooted farming land, which that's very close to Russian culture. It's roots, yeah, about roots. So once the roots been cut, people are totally lost. Of course, my generation managed to change, you know, but still, you know, I'm depressed every day, but anyway. Um, <laughs> but most of people cannot find their own identity or the connection or the continuation with the past anymore. So it's very strange alienation, strange confusing on, on, on the daily life, you know, when they've been lo lo located, relocated. And that's what happened because you can imagine try to find a school for the children in one night in a different place, you know, couldn't find the shopping, you know, don't know where I go to buy this and that. And in the beginning of the film, when I showed this older man lost, you know, that's what happened, you know. You, you think you have Alzheimer's disease? No. The state give you this disease. If, if a man is interested in the, in the political change and the social change and the, and the architecture, whatever, you should study China. Nothing to do with, you know, whatever, the past, but because the complexity of, of, the, of the country and the political shape of the country is, is really very interesting.